What does a new home mean for a single mother on the West Coast? A whole new life. Paying tribute and saying thanks to Team Guju. For giving us a fabulous week, a wonderful game, and a magic moment at the end of that game, which I, I don't think, I don't think that collectively as a province we will ever see again. Well, prepare for a messy drive tomorrow morning as snow, ice pellets, freezing rain will eventually mix over to rain, drizzle and fog for the afternoon. Windy conditions as well. The details are coming up. Well, everyone knows that these are tough economic times. Yes, but from the shoppers flocking to a new store opening in Stavanger Drive this morning, you'd never know it. But that area has lately taken some hits with Target and Future Shop closing. And Costco says they're pulling out and moving to Galway. Yes, uh, so is that area in trouble? Let's check in now with Here and Now's Jeremy Eaton. Uh, Jeremy, so from what you've seen, is that area hurting? Based on what we saw today and actually what we're seeing right now with uh, all the cars here in the parking lot, certainly not. This parking lot at Marshalls has been busy, almost like, uh, dare I say it, Costco at Christmas. But keep in mind, today is the opening day. Still, shoppers flocked to the new store on Stefanger Drive, eager to get a quick peek at what the store had to offer. Now, the company that owns Marshalls also owns Winners, so in case you're wondering, the two stores are very similar. If you were looking for evidence of a weak economy in St. John's, you wouldn't find it here today. Long lineups at the cash, a good sign for business, and a great sign for the area. One that will soon be saying so long to one of its bigger stores, Costco's, in the coming months. But... That doesn't mean the area is dying. I don't think it'll shrivel up. It'll change. It'll be, uh, uh, it'll redevelop, and uh, it may take a little bit of time for, for that to happen. Uh, but it's still a, a very busy place. There's a lot of businesses here, and a lot of people uh, that still come here to shop. So I don't think it's, uh, it's going to change. The dynamic of it uh, will, will change, but it certainly won't be going anywhere. Now, earlier, when I spoke to Danny Breen earlier today, he said in that chat that people, he has heard that people are looking at the old Target building to possibly redevelop it. He also talked about the old Canadian Tire building on Elizabeth Avenue, which has seen new life and is flourishing with new businesses. Now, the future of this area is uncertain, but one thing is known, Stefanger Drive will look a little different in the coming months. Reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Jeremy Eaton in St. John's. His dramatic Briar victory was still burning bright today, nearly 48 hours since Team Guju sent curling fans into a euphoric frenzy. Premier Dwight Ball hosted a celebratory rally for the team at Confederation Building this morning, and it was clear fans are not yet ready to stop celebrating the achievement of these first-time Canadian champs. Here now is Terry Roberts reports. Brad Gushu and his mates ended a 41-year briar drought for this province on Sunday, becoming the Canadian men's curling champions. Well, that's the kind of accomplishment that gets you a lot of attention from politicians, especially if you're a struggling government like the one led by Dwight Ball. Well, if you look back on Wednesday of, the, of last week, Tuesday, Wednesday of last week, even Brad Gushu's team was, was really neck and neck to the victory. What happened on Sunday night? I'm predicting the same thing for this Liberal government. A confident premier hoping to take a page out of the Team Guju playbook, a playbook that has already claimed a world junior crown, an Olympic gold, and now a coveted briar. The face of the team was a few minutes late, but that only added to the hype as Guju arrived, setting off a welcome fit for a Canadian champion. Children and adults sharing in a sporting achievement on two levels, hosting a first-class tournament and a storybook ending. Thank you for the great ambassadors you've been for our province. It started three years ago with a tweet. Skip Brad Guju asked for the briar to be staged in St. John's. He admitted there was a lot of pressure, but credited the hometown fans for helping push his team to victory. I'm obviously biased, but I truly feel it was the best briar I've ever been a part of. So. Winston Howell watched most of the action on television, but couldn't miss the chance to thank Guju in person. I think it's wonderful what he did for Newfoundland and for St. John's and the area. Wonderful. Got all kinds of money and tourists and everything else. I think it's wonderful. Just I could get emotional. I'm so happy for these guys that uh, 
just to say thank you for giving us a fabulous week, a wonderful game, and a magic moment at the end of that game, which I, I don't think, I don't think that collectively as a province we, we'll ever see again. Memorial University's curling team is hoping Guju's win will rub off. The Seahawks will play at the National University Championships in Thunder Bay this weekend. Watching Brad and his team throughout this past week gave us so much motivation. Uh, I know as a team we've been looking up to Brad ever since we started curling. So to see him achieve a goal he's been looking for his whole life, it really gives us the drive to do well next week. Team Gushu will now will refer to them as Team Canada. Gushu and his mates will head off to the World Championships in Edmonton later this month, carrying the hopes of not only this province, but of the entire country. Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. Well, we spoke with all the Team Guju or Team Canada members today, and we'll hear from them coming up in about 20 minutes. But still with the Guju rink, the province announced another development in the Team Guju Highway today. That's the roadway that will eventually connect the Outer Ring Road with Pitts Memorial Drive. Now, there's a tender out for an overpass at Topsail Road. This follows last month's tender for a section of the highway from Kenmont Road to Topsail Road. Uh, listen, we're going to deliver. Uh, we we made the promises have been made before. We're delivering on a lot of these promises, and the Team Gusha Highway certainly one of the ones that we're going to see conclusion. While the deputy mayor of St. John's could be out of commission for a few months, Ron Ellsworth posted on Facebook last night that he needed surgery on his leg, which he injured about a month ago. The deputy mayor says his leg wasn't improving, so he went and saw a specialist who recommended surgery. Now that was scheduled for today, and he'll be working from home until he's mobile again. Full recovery could take anywhere from six months to a year. Well, police investigators are trying to piece together what caused a fatal snowmobile crash near River of Ponds on the Northern Peninsula. The accident happened last night, killing a 46-year-old man. The RCMP say there doesn't appear to be any witnesses. Weather conditions were good last night, and it doesn't appear visibility was a factor in the crash. This fatality is the latest of several snowmobile-related deaths in recent weeks. Well, the trial of a tour boat captain has been delayed because of a legal argument about an expert witness. Walter Reddick of Torres Cove was the skipper that's accused of getting too close to whales near Cape Spear in 2014. Now, he's been charged with disturbing a marine mammal under the Fisheries Act, the first time such a charge has been laid in Newfoundland and Labrador. The charges date back to August 2014 when research scientists of the Department of Fisheries and Oceans were studying whales near Cape Spear while being recorded by a CBC crew. There's a desperate search off Ireland tonight for three missing Coast Guard workers who were on board a Sikorsky S-92 helicopter that crashed. One body has been recovered off the Mayo Coast. The search continues for three crew still missing from that aircraft. The timeline shows that search and rescue re responded to a call from a vessel in distress last night just after 9.30. It disappeared from radar screens about three hours later. Sea conditions were rough at the time and Visibility was not good. The helicopter was supplied to the Coast Guard by CHC Ireland. Tonight we have an update on that Habitat for Humanity house in Cornerbrook. After months of waiting, there are two lucky families that have qualified to live in the duplex. Now the house is still not finished, but there's one single mother who can't wait for her new life. Here now is Colleen Connors takes us inside the house. This single mom of two spends every spare moment here. She measures and cuts small pieces of insulation and fills the walls of her new home. Well, my dad is just up the street so I can like walk to work and my dad or school is right there and it's, it's gonna be a big, big change for the better. She already has the paint colors picked out. So do her two daughters that will each have their own room. A whole new life. We were in a small two bedroom apartment and the, my girls were sharing a room, constant arguing and being girls. <laughs> and they're, they're very excited, very excited to have their own rooms. Habitat for Humanity offers an interest-free mortgage to qualified applicants. Future homeowners volunteer up to 500 hours during the building process as a down payment. And after a lengthy application process and a lot of paperwork, Bellows found out she qualified in January. I've been here every volunteer day. 
um, probably 50 hours, maybe, so far. A lot more to come. Yeah, sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Volunteers from the local Knights of Columbus install drywall with the help from the project manager. Don Carter can't wait to hand over the keys to two deserving families. They're, these are working people who want to move ahead. They're not looking for a handout. Um, Melissa works at the fish plant, works hard, days off anytime she's available. She'll be here if there's someone going to be here. And same with the other family. Two of them work, uh, two, fa two of that members of that family work too. You know, not making big money, so you really desire to come up with a down payment and, and that sort of thing. So this is just a little extra push that uh, would get them effort or hit. Construction is behind schedule, but the house is almost finished. There's a push from volunteers to get the house done by spring. Soon, all the gyp rock and insulation will be up in this duplex, and volunteers will be plastering and painting. Now the plan is to have the families move in here in just a couple of months. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Corner Brook. Now you can find out more about what this Habitat for Humanity home means for people, and that's coming up in 35 minutes. Shedding and investment leaving, and there being serious problems to the core fundamentals of the economy here. That's when the fire hit. Well, CBC On The Money host Peter Armstrong is in Fort McMurray this week for a series of stories on that town's struggling oil economy. We'll tell you what he's seeing when we come back. His family name is synonymous with politics in this province, but Chess Crosby has taken a different path in life until now. Later, we ask the longtime lawyer why he wants in on politics at this time in his life.
there. Time now to check in uh, with Ryan for the <clears throat> weather forecast. Neo, I've heard from a lot more people who have had damage to their house, yeah. wondering what the weather is going to bring over the next couple of days. And today wasn't too bad if you had no, to be out beautiful. making some fixes, but yeah. It's not going to say this nice, is it? No, unfortunately not. We've got another system that's on the way. And again, if you've been watching any of the uh, American news today, they're dining out on this big snowfall wow. for yeah. the northeast parts of the U.S., New York, Boston, uh, and Philadelphia, all in the crosshairs the, of this next system, which is going to roll into our neck of the woods. Special weather statements are in effect across the island. We have rainfall warnings in effect from Conagra to the beer end of the southern Avalon, where amounts will be in that 20 to 30 millimeter range, though locally could see upwards of 40, even 50 millimeters. Not completely out of the question locally, again, along that southeast coast. We also have a lot of wind warnings in effect from the Buren right across to Port of Basque and then up the west coast. Again, these are, this is where gusts uh, in the 100 kilometer per kilometer per hour range to 120 along uh, the west coast in exposed areas like Bond Bay, the Norris Point area, and of course, Rec House will gust 120 tonight and 140 for tomorrow morning. As we back things off, this is the system, which is again just starting to push up across the Maritimes, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island and New Brunswick now into the snow and this low really starting to crank up just off Manhattan and you can see where we are mixing to rain just uh, off the Cape though this uh, system will continue to track in Nova Scotia will also see a mixed rain through tonight and that's where we'll get into the warm sector here across the island tomorrow as that warmer air surges in. So here's how it plays out. Uh, around midnight, the snow will arrive in Port of Basque, spread from south to north overnight tonight, well before morning in Corner Brook, and certainly by the morning commute, we are looking at snow on the ground and on the go from Corner Brook to Central to St. John. So a snowy and messy drive, unfortunately, for tomorrow morning for pretty much everybody. Now, as we move throughout the morning hours, likely already seeing some mixing even as of 7 a.m. for places like Port of Basque and the Buren Peninsula because temperatures are going to be near freezing. This is your morning outlook starting the day near minus 3 in St. John's. Minus six is from Gander back towards Corner Brook. Again, snow just arriving in the Straits in St. Anthony and will be a quiet start for most of Labrador. We'll walk you through your timeline now. Note this, the mixing from snow to ice pellets to freezing rain, then to rain from south to north through the day tomorrow. St. John's likely mixing over to rain around that lunchtime hour, maybe early afternoon. The freezing rain may hang on here just a little bit longer, and I'll show you that in just a second. Uh, and as we take a look into central, likely not mixing over from freezing rain to rain and drizzle until the early afternoon hours. Uh, everybody does mix over through that early afternoon hour time period south of the northern peninsula where we'll stay snow, ice pellets, a little bit of freezing rain mixing in for the St. Anthony region. It's going to be all snow for southeastern Labrador and back across to the Happy Valley Goose Bay region. Temperatures by the end of the day tomorrow there near minus 5 to minus 12. And again, we're warming up to 6 and 7 degrees across most of the island. And note those winds gusting in that 70, 80, 90 kilometer per hour range for most of the island, especially strongest along exposed areas of the coast, and those gusts upwards of 120 to 130 along the west coast. So St. John's looking at about here uh, two to five centimeters of snow. We're going to be changing over to freezing rain as much as five to even 10 millimeters of rain, freezing rain, not out of the question before five to 10 millimeters of rain and drizzle with RDF building in into the afternoon. This will be the bullseye in terms of where we see that heaviest freezing rain. And again, from the southern shore up through Metro to the northwest Avalon to Bonavista is that best chance of five to 10 millimeters of freezing rain. Snowfall amounts by tomorrow afternoon, two to five centimeters for most of the east and northeast, getting into that five to 10 centimeter potential by the time we move towards the west coast and up towards the northern peninsula, adding in the Wednesday night back over to Thursday transition to snow for the west coast and up into southeastern Labrador. That's when we're creeping into those 10 to 15 centimeter amounts, maybe 20 plus by the end of Thursday in southeast Labrador. We'll talk more about this story with your long range coming up, Carolyn. Thanks, Ryan. Well, as Fort McMurray continues to rebuild after last year's devastating wildfire, so does Alberta's economy. The town, once booming from the oil industry, faces uncertainty over the province's struggling energy sector. But there appears to be hope on the horizon as Alberta pushes along with its road to recovery. The CBC's Peter Armstrong is host of On the Money, and he's in Fort McMurray looking into the situation there. 
probably all know the resiliency of Albertans in general and Fort McMurray in particular. And we heard a lot about what happened. And remember, the, the, the fires that devastated this community came in the midst of a crisis already with the price of oil plunging and jobs shedding and investment leaving. And there being serious problems to the core fundamentals of the economy here. That's when the fire hit and it was this double whammy that really sort of walloped the region. Well, now Alberta's economy is set to grow in 2017. The Commerce Board of Canada says it's going to grow by like 2.8 percent. It might lead the country in terms of economic growth. But for the first time in a really long time, it's not going to be energy that does that leading. It's agri-food, it's agriculture, it's tourism. And so now we're here to see, well, what happens next to a region like this? And does the sort of the, the rebuild and economic activity out of rebuilding this town from the ashes, will that sustain it until we get a better sense of what happens to oil and the long-term plan for the, the, the energy sector and the impact that has on everybody? I mean, you talk to people here, they literally look at the price of oil every single day to figure out what it means for them. These are people that don't work specifically in the oil industry they run you know an auto body shop across town or they, they run a oil field services camp they, these are people that aren't in the oil industry but they're so wildly dependent and that's what happens here throughout like you cannot talk to people here that aren't affected by that oil industry so what are they doing how do they get through this and and what are their prospects as they try to, to balance that on the one hand rebuilding after the fires and then get a sense of well what are they rebuilding themselves into well, back to New York City now and come from away. It takes a lot of money to put off a Broadway show and what the theater critics say could make or break a production and the livelihoods of all those involved. Here now's Angela Antle has more from New York. So the headline is come from away got mostly great reviews. Michael Paulson writes about theater for the New York Times. He was in Gander in October and saw the show in the ice rink with everyone from Gander and he was there opening night. Broadway is a very competitive market. There are more shows than there is audience. Most shows fail. About two-thirds of shows on Broadway fail. The creators knew that uh, it's got some challenges. It has an unknown title, it has no big stars, and it's a topic that people are squeamish about. And as a result, I think they wanted to take every opportunity they could to perfect it before uh, bringing it to Broadway. I've had a crash course in the business of Broadway this week. It can take over a year for a Broadway show to recoup its costs. Come From Away is a $12 million show, and so far in U.S. previews, they've netted $630,000. So they've got a ways to go. Brian Mosher is my colleague from CBC. Brian was in Gander during 9-11. He was the community uh, reporter there. And Brian, you were at the big party when those reviews came in. I was at the party and I actually learned how you can bring a big party to a halt. And apparently the magic hour, which I knew nothing about, is actually at 10 o'clock. And at 10 o'clock, party stops, iPhones, iPads come out, and everybody's reading reviews. Nobody knows there's a band on the stage, free bar, food everywhere. 10 o'clock, there's just all these little squares all around the room. Then there's people running across the room because apparently it was all thumbs up. I watched people running towards me shouting, the reviews are in, reviews are in. I was waiting for the next morning's paper. I mean, what do I know? <laughs> so the biggest news of the night was a positive review from the New York Times. Kelly Nesbrook, who writes for the Globe and Mail, called that review the Brantley Benediction. New York Times critic Ben Branley is notorious for scathing reviews and he called Come From Away a big bear hug of a musical and he made it a New York Times critic's pick. The producers didn't waste any time getting that sign up on the theater. For Here and Now, I'm Angela Antle in New York City. To the victor goes the spoils. The members of Team Guju are soaking up their Sunday night Briar win. Now, how hard is it to drink out of the Briar trophy? Well, find out coming up.
Welcome back to here and now. It wasn't an easy win Sunday for Team Guju at the Briar. They were up against a strong Team Canada and they also had injuries. Jeff Walker's shoulder prevented him from sweeping during much of that last crucial shot. But none of that really mattered today. They made the shot, they won the Briar, and today they were welcomed as heroes at Confederation Building. Now, I had a chance to chat with all four members of the winning team about that crucial final shot. Well, I, I felt pretty good about, uh, you know, internally about making the shot. I, I felt I knew what the weight was. There was a little bit of discussion about uh, it being a little bit heavier, and Brett told me six feet. I, I thought it might have been two or three feet heavier, and it turns out he was right because I didn't quite throw it hard enough. Once he let it go, we, we figured we'd have to sweep it most of the way, and... Uh, and Mark came in to help and we just put our heads down basically and went for the rest of it. We had a plan in place, you know, with Jeff's injury that I was coming out regardless. Not whether it was good or light or heavy, I was coming out just to be there and make sure. And obviously by the time I got out there, we realized that it was a little light and had to pound it. Uh, I never thought I'd be sweeping a draw to the button uh, like that in that situation. Um, but, you know, uh, Brett dug in. It was pretty frustrating. I was able to go right at the start until Mark got out there, you know, as little as I could do. Um, I actually had to switch arms because I couldn't put the pressure with my right arm, so I had to go with left arm, which is, as most curlers would know, is very difficult to do your opposite arm, So, and it's probably 60% of my what I could do on my other arm. So, it, yeah, it was, it, was, it was frustrating, but uh, when, when they got it there, it was, it was nothing, nothing better than that feeling. A lot of pressure. Uh, I'm not going to lie. There was an internal pressure from us just to, to win a briar for the first time, and and then also, you know, the city and the province. I think uh, getting to the final and, and being the number one team in the world, I think they uh, they expected us to win, and um, you know, we certainly felt it. But I thought we we handled it really well. I, I we had a plan in place, and, and we stuck to it, and, and it turned out pretty good. What's the reaction been in the 48 hours now since you've hoisted that trophy? It's been a little bit crazy. I, I kind of, you know, yesterday I really just lay in bed uh, and, and tried to catch up in some emails and texts and, and didn't even come close to making a dent. So uh, today it's, it's, it's been overwhelming. Obviously what happened here today at, at Confederation Building was, uh, was awesome. And, uh, you know, there's a number of things going to be planned over the next couple of weeks, which is going gonna, gonna to be a lot of fun. You're fortunate enough to have the gold medal and now you've got the briar. How do those two experiences compare? Oh, it's so hard to compare them both. We were much younger uh, when we won the Olympics and uh, maybe a little more, uh, we're, we're definitely a little more seasoned now. We, we kind of know what we've been through and, um, you know, we, we're not taking this for granted at all. We know how hard it's to actually win a briar and to get where we are and how much effort and time we've put into it. So. Um, you know, to win it at home was just extra special. And what was it like having that crowd that was just so rooting for you in order to win this? Yeah, it was unbelievable. It's, it's hard to put into words how awesome that crowd was. It, it, it fueled us. We fed off them, and I believe they fed off our emotion too, and it just made for a, a spectacular week of curling. Have you had to buy your own beer any time in the last 48 hours? <laughs> Good question, actually. No, but I, we, you know what, I think we had enough as a team after that uh, cele uh, the celebration there on uh, Sunday night during it went well into Monday morning. But uh, you know what, you got to do that. you got to celebrate and have some fun. And uh, you know what, uh, get that out of our system because we got uh, some work to do here now in the next 10 days, too, to get ready or, or two weeks to get ready for Worlds. So were you able to, did you guys actually drink out of the uh, cup? I think we all had had one one drink out of the cup. Yes, it was it was tough though because it was a big trophy, so it was hard to lift that thing over your head, especially with a bad shoulder. <laughs> well uh, so, Peter, did you ask them uh, what kind of beverage they drank out of the cup? No, that, that was the one question I didn't ask, although I'm betting there was probably something local. Mm -hmm. And in that case, I'm betting this is probably the first time that that tankard has ever been filled with, like, Blue Star or Black <laughs> Horse or Jockey Club. So, uh Another first, I guess, for this whole event. Yeah, big mystery. Maybe we'll find out sometime. So what are their plans now? Yeah, so I asked them about the World Championships. They're coming up in Edmonton, and we can, we'll hear more about how they're preparing for that because, of course, now they're Team Canada, and that'll be coming up a little later in the show. His father led a life of politics, as did his father before him. And now longtime lawyer Chess Crosby wants in on the family's political dynasty. After the break, he explains why. Hear them at night? Yes.
Welcome back to Here and Now. When lawyer Chess Crosby heads out over the highway this week to meet face to face with Newfoundlanders, he'll be starting down the road to putting his family name back into provincial politics. He's traveling the province for what he calls Connect with Crosby meetings to seek support in a possible bid for the PC leadership. Now, the Crosby name is synonymous uh, with politics in this province. Of course, Chess's father, John, spent a lifetime in that arena, and his grandfather, Father Chesley and his great grandfather, Sir John Chalker, were also drawn to political life. But Chess Crosby's chosen career is in the legal field. But now, as he nears what you would consider the usual age of retirement, he wants in on politics. So I met up with him to ask why now. Well, I had an idyllic childhood here starting from 61 when it was built. Uh, what we're standing on right now, although it's hard to say, is a wharf that juts out into the lake, or the pond we called it, Hogan's Pond. And I spent my summers uh, swimming a lot. And you know, you grew up in a very political household. I'm sure around the dinner table there was a lot of talk about uh, politics, and I'm sure you've heard before your family described as a political <laughs> dynasty. Oh yeah, I, I uh, was uh, fascinated by the whole thing, and I used to, after, when I was small, small, and after my bedtime, I'd leave my do bedroom door open and I'd listen to the talk out in the living room. Well, my bedroom is down there. And so, in order better to eavesdrop, I'd leave it open a bit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, growing up around that, uh, you, you know, you never entered into politics. Did you think about going into politics to follow in your father's footsteps and your grandfather's footsteps and your great-grandfather's yeah. footsteps? Well, it, you know, it's, it's kind of <laughs> like people growing up in the context of a family business. It's what you're exposed to. So I always had it in the back of my mind, but I guess common sense no! uh, prevailed. Oh, oops. <laughs> My wife gave me that just in case I were to become premier. No! No, no, no! So, so I've really enjoyed my uh, legal career. And, you know, life is a matter of opportunity as well. So, um, opportunity has now come along. But you did go through, you know, your 20s and your 30s and your 40s and your 50s without. Uh, you know, dipping your toe in, into politics. So what is this opportunity now that's kind of making you uh, take that leap? Well, I sold my old law firm after 25 years, which seemed to be long enough, uh, about a year ago. So uh, as it happens, I have the decks cleared to do this kind of thing. You know, politics is so much about uh, personalities and people are so used to seeing you on television. You're the lawyer, you're the calm, measured. Some might say, you know, a bit monotone in comparison to the colorful political character uh, that was your father. How are you kind of tackling that image? Are you going to try to reshape that, to break it, to connect with people? Um, yeah, I think, you know, as I relax in a situation, and, uh, and political situations are new to me, I've, no. had, uh, I've had a career in law, and I've developed the skills and the knowledge that are required to do that. So it's a transition in the politics, and I recognize not everyone makes it. There are a lot of people, um, Mr. Ignatia, for example, federally, the liberal leader, uh, might be an example of that. People who are successful in the professions or in business life um, come into positions of leadership and don't really translate over into it. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen to me. I think I know what's required to connect with people. Uh, I'm working on all that. How difficult is it for you, though, to make that transition from, you know, being in the courtroom uh, to, say, throwing darts with someone in a shed? Well, what makes you think I don't throw darts in a shed? I don't know. Do you throw darts in a shed? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I enjoy a beer while I'm doing it. Uh, well, this is why you're doing the interview, because you don't know Chess Crosby, the non-lawyer, non right? Right. So out here in Hogan's Pond, I did a lot of water skiing. Um, I did a lot of uh, adventure travel when I was younger. I went to Israel, for example, and worked on a kibbutz and got caught in the middle of a war. I went to India and studied yoga. Mm -hmm. uh, and do you still practice yoga? Absolutely. For over, over 30 years now, I've been a student of yoga. I, I like pranks. 
Mm -hmm. um, I own a moose suit, for example. A moose <laughs> suit? A moose suit, yes. I wore it uh, out to a hunting camp. So you are also a moose hunter? Mm -hmm. I tell you, it started now uh, when I turned 50 years old, which is 13 years ago. Before that, I used to go with my friends and we'd go, you know, on our various expeditions. And I, I did it for the camaraderie, but I never imagined I'd like actually, you know, killing something. Mm -hmm. And um, it just seemed a little barbaric or whatever, right? If uh, that's all you know about it. And I happened to draw a moose tag and I had my first kill and I loved it. I think, actually, Carolyn, there's something, at least for men anyway, maybe women too, genetic about it. At least that's how I got it figured because I went from someone who wasn't that interested to somebody who was a real enthusiast for moose hunting. Do you think that genetic kind of tendency could translate into politics in any way? <laughs> well, um, you know, people are political animals, right? That's what the philosophers tell us. So there must be a political gene in us. I must be a late bloomer. I, you know, I still have some, uh, some professional time left in me. I've had a good run in law. Um, I've managed to become financially independent that way. Uh, so the timing just seemed to be right. It's in my blood, as we've talked about. And, you know, ultimately the answer I give myself is if I didn't do it when I'm 80 or 85 years old, I'd probably regret it. So I do believe in living your life without regrets. We didn't do it this year. The weather update is brought to you by Bell Tone Hearing Service St. John's, helping the world hear better. I have to see a little bit of a different side mm -hmm. to Jess Crosby. Great job. And it'll be Yoga. interesting to see who else steps up in order to yes. uh, run against him. That'll yeah, be one of the key questions. Yeah, some possibilities. Yep. Wait and see, I suppose. Uh, wait and see about the weather? Not so much. We kind of <laughs> know what we're getting uh, as we move into tomorrow, which is a little bit of everything. Snow, ice pelts, freezing rain. And then RDF on the menu. And in oh, fact, I'm thinking great. fog patches are going to be a pretty big issue for the latter half of tomorrow through tomorrow night, even into Thursday. Again, lots of snow on the ground, the warm air coming in. Uh, we'll have that uh, uh, fog in the mix, especially across the southeast where the temperatures are going to be uh, rising up. And we'll have that rain on the go. And there is the system. And again, the center of the low just off of Manhattan right now. And we are seeing that rain starting to mix over. Note the uh, Yarmouth area of uh, Nova Scotia, that south coast, just starting to get into that warm sector here. And as is the Bay of Fundy starting to move into that warmer air. Now that warm air will surge up across most of Newfoundland is going to see that change over to rain. Rainfall warnings in effect for the southeast, 20 to 30 plus millimeters. Special weather statements for everybody else because it is a messy mix of snow and ice and freezing rain. Wind warnings in effect from the Buren to the Port of Basque region up the west coast is where we'll see gusts potentially in the 130 range. Rec House likely 140, even 150, not out of the question. And most of the south coast in that 100 kilometer per hour range. Now it's a messy mix for pretty much everybody. I'm going to back off the screen, let you absorb that. Again, the southeast, two to five centimeters of snow, two to five millimeters of freezing rain, 20 to 30 plus millimeters of rain. It's the Northeast Avalon, in fact, all of the Northern Avalon, back towards Clarenville, Bonavista, uh, where we could see upwards of five to even 10 millimeters of freezing rain tomorrow before the transition to rain. Again, bit of snow and ice before that. Uh, five to 10 centimeter possibilities of snow and ice pellets for central and western parts of Newfoundland. And then the snow and ice uh, will even mix over the Northern Peninsula, but uh, it looks like the bulk of the snow will be set for the Straits and Southeast Labrador, including Cartwright, where we, by the time we add in the Thursday totals, could be creeping towards that 20, 25 centimeter range. Here's how it's going to play out for your timeline. And again, the snow spreads in tonight. It is a snowy commute from St. John's to Cornerbrook tomorrow. The wind's cranking up 70, 80, 90 kilometer per hour gusts, and that rain lingers into the afternoon for the drive home. Bit of a break as we work towards central and west, more of a drizzle mix on the go. Temperatures again rising six, seven degrees in those fog patches on the menu. Well below zero in Labrador through the day tomorrow with snow pushing in to Labrador City, Happy Valley, Goose Bay, Cartwright, and that snow does continue overnight and a second round comes in as we move into the Thursday time period. This is where we'll start to get into those higher potential snowfalls for you folks. For the island on Thursday, it's a colder air wrapping back in. Showers will mix back to flurries. 
For central Newfoundland, as temperatures fall, we'll see light snow or flurries for the west coast. St. John's in the east will see more sh scattered showers, drizzle and fog patches, and snow and wind will continue in southeastern Labrador. Note the winds will stay a little on the breezy side even as we move into the uh, th Thursday night time period, but starting to ease on Friday. We'll see the colder air continuing to surge back in, and so temperatures are back near the freezing mark with scattered flurry chances. We'll see uh, flurries clearing out in Labrador, sun and cloud on the menu for Lab West on Friday, and actually Saturday looking pretty solid as well. Flurry chances. Sunday looks quiet until Sunday night when our next system rolls in, which does look like another messy one for Monday. Sunday night into Monday, which will linger into Tuesday. Labrador, again, a pretty solid weekend shaping up. Snow chances again by Tuesday. Time now to meet our Young Athlete of the Day. And uh, this is Thomas Wolfrey. He's the only goaltender this year for the Lewisport Adam Seahawks. He's nine years old and is enjoying his time between the pipes. Yeah, his favorite goalie is James Reimer of the Florida Panthers. And when he isn't playing hockey at the stadium, Thomas can be found playing hockey in the shed with his dad, brother, and uncle. Nice. We're wishing Optimus Rhyme some luck tonight on the ice against the Leafs. Uh, thanks, uh, Thomas. You're today's Young Athlete of the Day. On here and now, I take you inside the Corner Brooks Habitat for Humanity house and introduce you to one of the women that's going to live here. Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, it's a big gift that will make a big difference to a single mother of two daughters in Cornerbrook. Here and Now's Colleen Connors spoke with Melissa Bellows about getting a new home thanks to Habitat for Humanity. You were just telling me that we're standing in um, what's soon to be your home. And which room is this? This is the master bedroom. How exciting. What is it like to be standing here? Very exciting. Very exciting. <laughs> Do you have the plans in your head about where the bed's going to go, what colors are going to be here? Mm, I know my colors and I just got a new bedroom set, so I don't really know where it's going to go yet. <laughs> what color did you choose? Uh, purple and gray. Very nice. So what kind of work are you doing uh, here today on this cold, cold, stormy day? Insulation. Do that again? I'm doing insulation. And what does that mean? 
I'm putting insulation between the duplex, put, putting up the firewall. It's pretty cool. So you just kind of cut up this stuff, measure it out, put it up? Yep. And how, uh, how many hours do you think you've been punching here so, so far? Oh, I've been here every volunteer day. <laughs> um, probably 50 hours, maybe, so far. A lot more to come. I bet, I bet. So can you tell me more about who's going to live here with you? Uh, me and my two daughters. Brianna's 13 and Shailen is 5. They're very excited. <laughs> I bet. So what was the application process like in order to qualify for this? Uh, it was very long. For the first one was just a couple pages, like basic information and stuff. And then the second one was like, I'm pretty sure we faxed off like 70 papers. <laughs> it, it was a lot to it. And then when did you get the news that you were the one that would get to live here? The day after my daughter's 13th birthday, which was January the 19th. And what did, uh, what did that feel like when you got that call? Overwhelming. Definitely overwhelming. I guess I have to ask, what does it mean for you and your daughters to have this brand new home? A whole new life. We were in a small two-bedroom apartment, and the, my girls were sharing a room, constant arguing and being girls. <laughs> and they're, they're very excited, very excited to have their own rooms. Do they have their plans laid out as to what their rooms are going to look like, first time having their own room? Kind of. My oldest kind of got her paint colors picked out and her bedroom layout picked out. My youngest just wants white walls. She just, all she cares about is the color. <laughs> So how will it change your life to have this house, your day-to-day, your, -day, your job? Like, how will, how will everything change? Uh, well, my job is just up the street, so I can, like, walk to work. And my daughter's school is right there. And it's, it's going to be a big, big change for the better. Any idea when you'll be moving in? I have no idea. Not soon enough. <laughs> It'll probably be May. Well, what a lovely piece there from Colleen Connors. Earlier in the show, we heard about Team Guju and how they made their big win. But now, how do they plan to handle the World Championships? And what about another shot at a second Olympic gold? Well, here's what four members of the newly minted Team Canada told me this afternoon. You've seen a lot of people come up to you today and either say, now my kids are interested in curling or now I've become a curling fan and I wasn't before. Yeah. How much do you think this win will do for the sport in this province? I certainly hope it does a lot. I think uh, it's really important now for the clubs and our curling associations to capitalize on the interest uh, in the sport. Um, you know, I, of all the briars I've been to, it was definitely the youngest crowd I've seen. We've seen a lot of kids in the stands and, and that's great because they might grow up dreaming of playing in the briar or Scotties and as opposed to winning a Stanley Cup. So, um, you know, it's, it can only be positive for the sport, but, you know, us as, as stakeholders in the sport have to make sure that we do our job and, and, uh, and capitalize on it. I, I just hope, you know, what we've done this week has shown that, you know, when you, you, you work hard and you dedicate yourself to something and just believe in the teammates that you have, that good things can happen. And there was a lot of young, young people in that crowd on, uh, on Sunday night and through the week. And hopefully it's inspired a few of them to kind of say, you know what, that could be me in, in a few years or down the road. It's, it's, it's just amazing to, to feel that sense of accomplishment after we've, you've worked so hard for something. How much of an opportunity does this present for other curlers in this province who have maybe wanted to participate at the provincials, but it's like, wow, we're never going to beat the Guju rink. Now that you're Team Canada, there's got to be another Team Newfoundland and Labrador for the next prior. Yes, that's going to be exciting actually to watch to watch the process next year, watch the, how many teams enter, and, and obviously the provincials is going to be very competitive because there's a lot of good teams um, and a lot of I think teams that could win it. So it's, I think it's going to be a really good provincial um, as well as I think also just with the briar here for the, for the grass roots, roots, just you get a lot of kids out there. It gets to see what, what curling is all about and hopefully we get some more people entered in the junior curling and, and grow the game. What is your mindset now going into the world? Just, you know, we get to wear that maple leaf again. It's, it's going to be great. Um, we're not going to change a whole lot in terms of our own preparation. This team works really hard, and now we're focused on the next goal, and that's to, to win a world championship for Canada, and but mostly you know, for Newfoundland and Labrador. Anytime you get to wear the Maple Leaf, uh, it's incredible. Um, 
yeah, we're just looking forward to Edmonton and uh, and that experience is going to be unreal. Is that the last on the list? It, well, yeah, obviously, yeah. It's uh, the last one that we'll have to accomplish uh, to check off the box. But, uh, you know, after that, we're, we're qualified for the Olympic trials again. I'd love nothing more than to... Uh, and to get another trip to the Olympics. So, you know, we're going to focus on the World Championships and then at the end of the season refocus and uh, get ready for the, for the fall and the Olympic trials. What's it like for you as one of the team members who doesn't have a gold medal already? It's, uh, it's really exciting. Obviously, uh, I like where we are right now, um, but that is the trials next December is going to be as tough a tournament as we'll ever play in with the best teams that we'll ever play against in a for his, uh, when it comes to parity, I mean, any there's there's nine teams. There's probably probably any one of the nine could win it. Um, so it's gonna be it's gonna be a tough tough go. But I, I do like our our chances, and uh, I like my team. Well, the members of Team Guju aren't the only well-known names from this province getting a little bit of recognition this week. Actor Alan Hocko is in Toronto, where a movie he worked on received two Canadian Screen Awards last night. The movie Weirdos was shot in Nova Scotia, and it follows a 15-year-old boy and his girlfriend as they hitchhike across that province back in 1976. Alan Hocko plays the father of the boy, and he spoke with the CBC's Dwight Drummond about living in this province while pursuing an acting career. Most people, when, when I was coming up through the, the years in, as an actor, a young actor, when everybody would go to L.A. for pilot season, I'd go back to Newfoundland and Labrador uh, instead of going to L.A., which I, really no one, no one talked me out of doing that. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I've committed myself to it, and I, I love it. I love living here. I love telling our stories. And this one's McIver. You know, Daniel McIver was one of my mentors. He taught me at National Theatre School. He was the first actor I ever saw perform live wow. when I was uh, five years old, and he was doing Hansel and Gretel in Newfoundland. He was the first uh, director to hire me in Toronto at Theatre Pass when I was an actor. And he's been like a bit of a mentor of mine. And when him and Bruce got together and had this script, uh, uh, I read it, you know, and I jumped on it. I was, I was delighted to be a part of it. Well, I'm not sure if you've heard or not, but uh, here Speaking and now, of awards, yes. Here and now won a Canadian Screen Award uh, last week for Best Local Newscast in Canada. Not sure if we mentioned it. We might have. <laughs> Maybe once or twice. Uh, but we have to give credit where credit's due. And, of course, Jonathan Crow was a huge part of that team, uh, as we all are here at uh, CBC NL. But he's since moved on uh, to uh, teach at College of the North Atlantic Journalism. 
but uh, I had to make sure that he had his moment. Like the Stanley Cup, everybody gets a day, right? So I took the award to Sunday Night Hockey where we laced him up every week and uh, made sure he had his, uh, his time with the award. Well, I hope he's watching right now. And where sure is the is. award? Did you get it back from him? Uh, you know what? <laughs> He might have kept it. <laughs> no, I did. But uh, he's doing great, by the way. He is uh, having a great time teaching, and I'm sure all those students are learning a lot from uh, from our good buddy John. And we still miss him. <laughs> have a good night, everyone. Have good a good night. night.